a todos. Welcome to you all. I am Jacqueline Muro. I'm the acting deputy chief of mission and also the media advisor for the Embassy of the United States in Uruguay. Thank you very much for being with us today to this presentation on human rights, understanding the Uyghur crisis. This is going to be presented together with our experts, our experts in the, in the topic, Murat, Harry, Andre, Krishnesh, and Elise Anderson. It is a pleasure for us to offer this interesting presentation and to highlight the efforts of different countries and communities to preserve the human rights of all the people being respectful of their freedom. These basic rights are based on values such as dignity, justice, equality, respect and independence. And as our State Secretary Mike Pompeo said, these inalienable rights are fundamental for those of us who are Americans. It is for this that the United States reaffirms its commitment to protect freedom. I'm going to take some minutes to introduce each of our uh, presenters. Murad Harry is a physicist, member of the Yugo community, and an international activist for human rights. Andre Klimisch has a PhD. He's a researcher from the Czech Academy of Sciences. And he has specialized in Xinjiang and Chinese politics. And lastly, our moderator, Elise Anderson, she's got a PhD, she's an expert researcher on human rights of Uyghur. Thank you very much. And now let's have our speakers. Hi, thank you so much for having us here um, this morning afternoon or evening, depending on where in the world you are. As you just heard, my name is Elise Anderson, and I'm going to be moderating um, this discussion today, which I am positive will be a very lively and interesting one. So you just heard very brief bios of the two panelists um, in this discussion today, but I would like to give both of them a chance to introduce themselves at greater length and to tell us a little bit more about themselves and about how they're connected to this issue. So, Hamrat, would you um, like to begin? Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for this opportunity. And I had never traveled to Latin America. and I had known uh, Uruguay from its uh, legendary former president, uh, Jose Mujica, if I pronounce it correctly, a model uh, leader admired by many people around the world. Uh, you may hear about the situation of Uyghurs uh, since 2017. Uh, the Uyghurs have been widely covered in uh, international media uh, before the cold numbers and the numb statistics. Let me tell you a short story about uh, Myself, a simple person, we are affected by this. I'm a child of an ordinary family. I was born and raised in an ordinary family. There's no lofty ideals or ambitions. My parents had been uh, living a peaceful life uh, since their retirement, just like normal everyday people, uh, not caring about politics or uh, big issues. They were uh, hanging out with their friends and uh, going on my uh, trips and uh, spending uh, retirement days with joy and happiness. In uh, 2016, uh, actually, uh, with my two cute daughters and my beautiful wife, I, uh, we, I went to visit them. Uh, we had a very fun three months together. Of course, uh, the policies against Uyghurs uh, by then also were uh, not good. Uh, and uh, although we were upset by uh, the checkpoints and the street uh, patrols and uh, strict surveillance, uh, but we were still happy to, to gather as a family and uh, to have a good time together. Then, when uh, after we returned to Finland, it was as if a typhoon had destroyed everything. Uh, to be honest, I never wanted to be an activist. Uh, I wanted to be a simple person, to spend my uh, 
I spend a simple life with my uh, simple family, uh, with uh, simple joy. Unfortunately, the uh, Chinese government's policy toward uh, Uyghurs did not allow it. Uh, the Chinese government had taken my parents into concentration camps in 2017, mom uh, first, then 2018, in the beginning of the year, my father. I had to save my parents. I had to protect their rights then. Uh, then I turned to become an activist. In the beginning, I didn't know what to do. I told uh, others that there was a mass uh, arbitrary detention of Uyghurs in China, but no one actually believed it. Uh, no one saw such a thing uh, could uh, possibly happen in 21st century. So I realized that alone, I could not expose this tragedy. Uh, I produced testimonial videos and uh, posted them on social media like Facebook. And uh, I told other Uyghurs in diaspora to produce uh, the same testimonial videos and uh, publish them on social media platforms. Then I traveled around the world. Uh, like Saint Paul, but I'm not comparing myself with uh, Saint Paul, but then his, uh, I, I take model from him, then met with the uh, Uyghur diaspora, uh, chatted with them, and uh, listened to their uh, tragic stories, so sad stories. And I collected testimonial videos and uh, collected information about uh, disappeared families of the Uyghurs in the diaspora. And, uh, shared them as an open source on my website. Uh, gradually, a wave began to rise and uh, Uyghurs began to rise to defend their rights and uh, their rights of their families. Uh, however, uh, the Uyghurs themselves cannot overcome this difficulty alone. And uh, Uyghurs need the help of the righteous people. Uh, they need to strength be, uh, be strengthened, uh, to be with them, uh, to hear their tragedy, and to help uh, them spread their voice. The Uyghurs have uh, three weapons. Uh, don't afraid when I say Uyghur have weapons. One is hope. Uh, the other one is voice. And the third one is their friends. Uh, the three, uh, like the Holy Trinity, have been the center of the Uyghur movement so far. Uh, we need friends, uh, we need good Samaritans. Uh, finally, I conclude with uh, good news. Uh, on 24th December 2018, my parents were released on the same day, uh, like a Christmas gift. And uh, I thank God for that. But however, we must remember that possibly millions of Uyghurs are still in those camps. And we don't know what's happening in those camps. And they must be released, and the Chinese state must change its uh, policy toward Uyghurs. And uh, Uyghurs must live with uh, human rights, uh, freedom, and uh, human dignity. Uh, that's all from me. Thank you. Paul Murad, would you like to share a little bit about um, these images? that are up on the screen? Oh, the first one uh, from the left is uh, me with my mother, Gyar Khan. Uh, it was, uh, I remember it was taken in 2016 when I was uh, traveling to Turpan, my homeland, uh, my home city. And the second one was uh, taken, I don't know, like maybe when I was nine or 10 or maybe 11. Uh, by then, uh, my mom was studying in Beijing. The third one was taken when I was in high school, if I remember. It was taken in a Turpan Karis Museum. That's, uh, yeah. Um, thank you so much for sharing, you know, how it is that you came to be part of, of this cause, why you're even um, sitting here with all of us today. It's a really moving and inspiring story. And I'm sure we'll get chances to hear more about it as the event continues to unfold. Um, now, Andre, I would like to extend the same opportunity to you. Would you like to tell us a little bit more about your work and how it is that um, you came to be involved in this issue? Sorry. Yes, thank you very much. 
thank you very much for invitation to this uh, seminar. Uh, my story is by far not as interesting as Hamurat, so I will keep it a little bit shorter. Uh, I'm a researcher based at the Czech Academy of Sciences. Uh, my involvement with the Xinjiang issue has been since uh, 1999, uh, when I started studying Uyghur, then I, start, then I went to Urumqi to learn Uyghur at the Xinjiang University, and I've continued uh, with my PhD and then started working as a researcher uh, on uh, Chinese, China and Xinjiang politics. And uh, besides that, I am trying to do uh, also some uh, public work or outreach work, which is mainly um, uh, writing uh, articles for more general platforms, outreach platforms in mostly in Czech or sometimes in English also. I do also media commentaries for Czech, uh, sometimes also international media. Um, I try to do public talks as much as I can in the Czech Republic and uh, in other countries also, etc. I have worked on uh, Xinjiang related issues with some uh, international organizations such as Human Rights Watch or uh, Radio Free Asia, for example. And um, yeah, uh, lately I've been working with the Uyghur diaspora in Turkey and a little bit in Central Asia also as well. And uh, that's about it briefly from me. All right, thank you. Yeah, um, I'm sure more details about some of this work will, like with Halmarat, might come out over the course of our discussion. So um, we have a little bit of a sense of an introduction to both of you now, but I have a feeling that a lot of our audience members might need or want a bit more of an introduction to the issue that we're here talking about today, right? This human rights crisis for Uyghurs. Um, Halmarat mentioned camps, in particular because his parents were taken away to these extra judicial, extra legal camps. Um, but those are not the full extent of what is happening in the Uyghur region right now. So can the two of you give us a broad level overview? Like what, what is this crisis? What components does it have? Um, Andre, would you? Uh, okay. Um, the the um, poly extrajudicial political re-education camps, as uh, Elise mentioned, are just, I think, the most visible uh, part of the problem, which has come out come to the center of attention since 2016, when the new provincial uh, party secretary Chen Chuenkuo has taken power and gradually the situation in the region become, became much more uh, tightly controlled. But uh, I perceive this situation as a, as a result of a decades-long process of uh, the ethnic policy, which has been implemented by the Chinese Communist Party for decades, uh, even prior to 1949. And uh, basically, the situation involves uh, all aspects of Uyghur life, be, besides uh, over a million uh, people being taken for various types of uh, political re-education re and uh, uh, imprisonment involving uh, regular prison sentences. I mean, uh, quote unquote regular, because that's a, a complex debate. What's what's regular? What's legal in a in the condition of a socialist uh, legal system, so to say. So. Um, the policies have been also impacting uh, family affairs, uh, the um, arrangement of Uyghur households, their birth policies, etc. So um, basically, the the impact is enormous and involves uh, all uh, spheres of Uyghur lives. Uh, just shortly, I please feel free to uh, um, pick up from here, Elise or or Halmurat. Yeah, Halmurat, would you add? Anything to that? Uh, maybe just, uh, well, what well, this uh, oppression, uh, I would say, like, it began since uh, Chinese communist regime uh, started to rule over China and uh, start to uh, governing in the uh, Uyghur region. So 
then this discriminatory po policy is getting worse after uh, Soviet uh, collapse of the Soviet Union because uh, China start to see that uh, possibility for the Uyghur independence may be uh, more uh, likely than before because uh, the other the Central Asian republics have been uh, get their independence, like Kazakhs and Kyrgyz and Uzbeks are the people who've been, you know, living with Uyghurs and the historic, have a historic uh, relationship with each other, maybe historic root to each other as well. So Chinese authority may be afraid one day. Uh, this will, you know, the have a great impact for the Uyghur national identity. Uh, then the, it will one day lead to Uyghurs demand a greater autonomy, for example, uh, maybe independence. So they start to afraid. And uh, since then, as I studied, I'm not research research on this, but I since then, like I believe that the China start to, you know, the more unsecure on the Uyghur region, uh, Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. So I think that's one of the uh, main uh, shifting point, uh, the collapse of Soviet Union. The Chinese uh, authorities, uh, you know, the untrust on the Uyghurs, like or lack of trust to the Uyghur population, it causes it more untrust uh, um, among the Uyghur population to the Chinese government. So it's like a bad uh, circle. Uh, it continued. I don't know if this word is correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah a circle, a, a vicious cycle, or a self. A vicious cycle. Yeah. Yeah. Or a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Create a problem you say you're trying to avoid. Yeah, so I'm hearing both you and Andre say um, this goes back decades, right? What's happening is not something totally new, necessarily. I would add to it, you know, in addition to the things you've heard about, like camps. And uh, so there's mass detention, mass internment in camps. There's mass imprisonment in the prison system happening alongside it, a totalitarian surveillance system, including technological surveillance and human surveillance. You heard a little bit about forced um, birth control, sterilization. Um, there's also a massive forced labor system that Uyghurs are being put into. So sometimes that's from a camp into forced labor or just into forced labor or it's connected to prison. It's, it's truly staggering. And, these things are all connected to older phenomena, right, through recent decades. But why now? Why has this come to a head since 2016 or 2017? What's your take on why now? Would you like to go for it, Andre? Take a stab at it. Uh, mm, I think uh, it's it's hard to hard to uh, see within the um, black box of Chinese elite politics, but I think it's a combination of several aspects. I think a major aspect is generally the changing nature of of um, of Chinese uh, of the society in Xinjiang and also in the in in whole China because I think. Uh, during the Xi Jinping period, uh, since 2012, uh, the party has uh, the, um, been forced to deal with a growing number of challenges, uh, both domestically and internationally. So uh, it's been having much more difficulties to rule. That's why it's more and more motivated to uh, invent either new methods, such as you mentioned, technological surveillance or cyber Leninist uh, techniques of rule or even to revive some uh, old uh, totalitarian methods that uh, the world basically thought were long uh, over, such as the mass detention in, in political re-education camps that we knew from Maoist China or from, uh, from Nazi Germany, <clears throat> for example. So I think this is one major reason. I think uh, the leadership was also motivated uh, by the protracted nature of the situation in, China, in, in Xinjiang and decided to uh, deal with it with uh, force, basically. 
Interesting. I, yeah, I think there are some great observations there. Hal Murat? Uh, I think it has maybe three uh, reasons. One is, uh, you know, like uh, uh, China, you know, took the bus of uh, war on terror, like uh, since uh, this uh, Bush administration uh, started the war against terrorism. China changed its uh, discourse and their its, uh, language. And they start to call, uh, before that, they call Uyghurs as a separatist. Uh, then they start to adopt this new term, a uh, new terminology, the terrorist. And for the benefit then, of the audience, could you, for, sorry to interrupt, for the benefit of the sure. audience, could you say roughly what year it was when they started? Well, it was like 2001, I, I believe, like uh, since uh, this uh, terrorist attack in a uh, double tower in the USA. Then, uh, then, uh, you know, the, after this uh, Iraq war, there is a new uh, uh, Islamic caliphate started, and China tried to uh, demonize Uyghurs, and before that, you know, there was 2009, there is a, a big, uh, a peaceful demonstration was uh, arranged by the Uyghur students in the beginning, but it became a riot after the Chinese uh, police, uh, like, how to say, the, uh, uh, how to say that try to stop it from happening. Then after it started, the uh, like the Urumqi massacre it, uh, turned into the massacre in the late. And then uh, many Uyghurs uh, lost their life, and many Uyghurs uh, lost their family members. Then uh, China need to maybe try some reason to uh, how to say the, mutualize those people. Uh, could be possible threat for them because China unjustfully treated those people. And I would believe like China overreacted to many things. So, and uh, after Xi Jinping came into power and the China already had this economic power and the diplomatic uh, statue, international uh, power, diplomatic, uh, good diplomatic relationship as well, and uh, have more confidence to do something like this. So he, you know, uh, uh, transferred uh, Chin Chang Guo, who was the party uh, secretary of Tibet, uh, from there to the Uyghur region, 2016, then initiated this so called uh, radication camps or the internment camp policies. But I believe it is concentration camps because what's happening there uh, make us recall the Nazi style concentration camps, but uh, Nazis uh, use that measurements to eliminate or genocide uh, European Jewish people. Yeah, thank you. I think it's the, the scholar Ryan Thum um, has, was quoted in a news article by BuzzFeed um, making the observation that what is happening combines the worst elements of what we saw with genocides in North America, apartheid in South Africa, the um, mass internment of Nazi Germany, and then also the police state of North Korea. So we're seeing like a convergence of some of the most horrible atrocities we know from the course of the 20th century, kind of all in, all in one place, all in one context. Um, Scholars and experts over the last year or so have started really coming out on the record and saying that um, what China is, do is doing amounts to crimes against humanity and also likely meets um, the criteria for genocide, right? And that this is legal experts who have come out and said things like this. Um, so, Broadly speaking, how have members of the international community responded to these atrocities? Um, I know that's a really big place to start, so maybe I can kind of hone it down a little bit. Many people have um, put faith in Muslim, the governments of Muslim majority countries around the world to take action on this crisis. Um, what has their response been, by and large? 
So Marat, I see you. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I can say just a couple of words. Like, uh, rather upsetting Uyghur people. For example, the prime minister or president of the Pakistan, the Imran Khan. Uh, when the British journalist or Australian journalist, if I'm, forget, I'm I'm sorry, like if I made this uh, wrong, like uh, ask him, like, do you know about this atrocity, you know, or the, the, the things that happening to Uyghur people? It's right next to Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan is one of the country have a historic relationship with Uyghur people, so it's uh, the neighbor of the Uyghur autonomous region. Then. He says he, he never heard about it, or he don't know. And this uh, uh, other Muslim majority countries leaders, uh, their uh, reaction to the this atrocity or the, this uh, China's uh, genocidal policy. I'm sorry, like if I say this because I'm an activist, not a, not an expert on this. Uh, and maybe I'm speaking sometimes uh, with uh, Uyghur sentiments. So. They are not really reacting, um, and uh, they're standing even with China. For example, Bin Salman was at the same time uh, committing a massacre in Yemen. Uh, Jose is like, what Chinese government doing is right, and uh, he actually supported Xi Jinping's measurement on the Uyghurs. And, uh, here, I want to add something. Like uh, when uh, we talk about the Uyghurs. Uh, Western media or all over the world, uh, different medias like to use the term uh, Uyghur Muslims, but Uyghurs are a modern nation. We are not, uh, you know, the small group of people. When we are talking about Uyghurs, 11 million to maybe 20 million people, we have many different peoples, like the sub uh, groups in Uyghur, like Christian minorities and uh, others. So, uh, so when people using this terminology, it's kind of pushing Uyghurs only to this uh, Muslim people and uh, or Muslim groups or the nations say, oh, this is your problem, you solve this, oh, you, you, you need to take care of them. And that's kind of upsetting us. And uh, Uyghur, Uyghurs' Muslimness is over uh, represented to the problem because it's not only the religious freedom problem, it's more, there, there are more other layers of the problem for example i wouldn't call my parents like uh, model muslims because my father is more like agnostic uh, my mother is from a secular family i never saw them to you know practice any religion and my family is multi-religious family we have christian relatives in my family and they also have been sent to concentration camps so yeah i mean like yeah, it's the Uyghurs are Muslim majority nation, and yes, those Muslims, Muslim countries, for example, Erdogan and the others, they are trying to create image of the or uh, savior of the Muslims or Muslim Ummah, but that rip it their hypocritic face over mask. So maybe that is uh, being used among Uyghur cows or the Uyghur plight, maybe being used for ripping out their. Hippocratic mask, but at the same time, all the real uh, problem of the Uyghur people and the real face of the Uyghur people. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, it was really insightful, right? I, I, Thank you. If I would sum up what I was hearing you say, it's that you know maybe it's a little problematic to think that we should just be putting all of our hope in the Muslim world and the Muslim world alone, yeah. right? Because it's not just a problem of religion. Yeah, thank it's you. Not Muslim, it's not Muslim problem, it's problem of humanity because once uh, before like it happened and we had this promise like never again, but most likely it is happening. Uh, I don't want to be a dogmatic, but according to this uh, Geneva uh, Genocide uh, Convention's uh, definition, What's happening to Uyghurs are, can be defined as a genocide. So we should never allow that happen. And of course, the similar things are happening in Myanmar and other places, for example, Yemen. Uh, yeah, so I really hope like we put uh, human rights and democracy uh, in a more important positions in our 
diplomacy with China or other countries. Mm, well, thank you. Thank you. Andre, do you have anything else to add? Yes, I would like to elaborate on the response of the Muslim majority countries. Another majorly important country, which is Egypt, has also supported China on its ethnic policy and in fact has cooperated with Chinese authorities in deporting Uyghurs and harassing the community uh, in uh, 2017. And another uh, massively important uh, Muslim majority country, Turkey, has limited itself to uh, more or less uh, ritualistic, uh, uh, rare uh, criticisms of China's uh, treatment of Uyghurs, which, uh, however, Turkey has not followed uh, upon with any substantial uh, support of the Uyghur uh, community in Turkey or vis-a-vis -vis China lately. So um, the situation, the response from uh, Muslim majority countries is close to zero. I think the only country which has uh, uh, supported them uh, also along Turkey is uh, Qatar in uh, summer of 2019. And so far, so far, meaningful initiatives have come from uh, the U.S. authorities or other other democratic countries, such as uh, recently. Uh, Subcommittee of Canadian uh, Parliament has declared the situation in uh, Xinjiang a genocide and uh, crimes of humanity. Okay, so you invoked the place I was going to go next, which was the response of liberal democracies. Would you care to elaborate a little bit more on what the response has been? You already mentioned the U.S. and Canada. Maybe you could bring up um, some specific things in the U.S. and or other action elsewhere. Uh, I think I think uh, speaking about speaking as an outsider here, Elise. Maybe this is something that you could address if you'd be willing to, because I think you might be more familiar with the situation in the United States than than myself, who who I'm, I'm as I'm saying I'm, I'm an outside observer. <laughs> well, um, first let me give Khalmarat a chance to respond with his understanding of what the U.S. has done, and then I'd, I'd be happy to uh, flesh out a little bit as a U.S. citizen, yeah. Okay, uh, well, uh, well, I'm, I would say like the Trump, administ during the time of Trump administration, uh, Uyghur issue was uh, taken to the level that had never been to that high in uh, U.S. policy, like there was a, uh, Uyghur Human Rights Act bill was uh, signed by uh, President Trump. And uh, now there is another uh, bill about uh, forced uh, laborers use it uh, by Chinese factories are uh, on its way to being signed in the USA. Uh, as an European and as an Uyghur who lives in Europe, uh, because during the uh, Trump administration uh, time, uh, the transatlantic relationship was not, I mean, like, not, not as uh, tight as I expected. So we had a kind of a uh, bit difficulties here to try to uh, explain or educate what is happening to the Uyghur people because uh, some people have a bias at what is happening to the Uyghur people may be exaggerated by the U.S. media because of it is, uh, uh, you know, the trade war against uh, China. But it's not, you know, the uh, it's not true. Uh, there are many Uyghurs uh, criticizing even American policies toward uh, some issues. But I still like, uh, I mean, like we are, we are still thanks for. Uh, for the USA, uh, America, to stand up for Uyghurs. And uh, I, I believe like USA can do even more. Uh, for example, uh, training Uyghur activists and uh, uh, not only the financially uh, have helping Uyghurs, but also, you know, the, using it as a global uh, the diplomatic uh, power or relationship to let other countries know more about the Uyghur issues. Uh, yeah, Great, thank uh, you. that's that's all. Uh, my, if I, yeah, thank you. Thanks. 
No, um, just for the benefit of anyone listening, yeah, I would add to it that the this particular bill that became law, so now the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act of 2020 became the law of the land in the United States in June of this year, I believe it was. Um, it passed with a near uh, unanimous vote in the Congress um, and then went to the president to be signed and it calls for um, putting sanctions on individuals who are responsible for perpetrating these crimes. So the US has actually put sanctions on several you know, high ranking officials who are responsible for what's happening. Um, there are also reporting requirements and so forth. And as the audience already heard, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act is also in the process of going through Congress and you know the whole process that a bill goes through in Congress. I mean, in addition to that, yeah, across the whole of the US government, there are a lot of different departments and agencies, including the State Department, you know, that have been um, making public statements um, on the issue in support of, you know, Uyghurs and other people suffering these abuses. And it's been positive to see. And it's been largely bipartisan, which I think is a really important thing. You know, <laughs> it feels kind of rare to uh, have something truly bipartisan in U.S. politics right now, but the Wheeler issue, the Wheeler crisis has managed um, to have that kind of broad support. So um, to shift to another question, oh, and I want to send a quick reminder to audience members um, from wherever you're listening, whether it's on Facebook or someone else, um, you have the ability to send us questions that you might like to ask the panelists. So in about five to 10 minutes, we'll be opening this up for your questions and we would love to hear from you. Please send us whatever it is you would like to know about. Okay, now back to the panelists. Um, you know, the US and some other countries have started to um, you know, speak up about what's happening and have even criticized China for its policies in some cases. How has China responded to that criticism? Andre, you want to take it first? Uh, China has uh, basically responded in a very usual way, which is by denying that something like this is happening, that there are problems in Xinjiang. They have started by denying the very existence of uh, camps. Since the beginning of the debate, they are only uh, admitted to the existence in October 2018 under the pressure of evidence and the ensuing discussion at the UN. And uh, since then, they have been vowing to continue the policy, to uphold the direction of policy in Xinjiang, as we've seen recently at the uh, Xinjiang Work Forum, which was held in September of this year. So uh, the response by China is that uh, we are doing everything correctly. Uyghurs are living a happy and stable life and uh, everything is okay. And do you think that there are people who believe that? I think we lost Andrew. That's a tough question. There are certainly people who say and repeat these things and I think uh, some of them probably also believe that, as we have seen on, on the case. There are people who really believe that. I think this is a really related also to um, the particular person's general political views. I think many people are willing to believe that this is a Western um, or US uh, concocted conspiracy and disinformation campaign against uh, China. So I think, yes, pe some people do actually believe this. Oh, interesting. Khomarat, I know um, that you have taken an interest in disinformation and how that's playing out in this whole situation. Um, would you have anything to add in that regard to, to Andre's comments? Yeah, like uh, since uh, beginning of this year or the the end of last year, there are uh, more videos made on uh, 
and uh, produced more videos, uh, denial videos by uh, Western looking Chinese people, I would say, because, uh, or the Western looking CCPs. <laughs> I'm sorry, like maybe, maybe not. Uh, they start to uh, trying to misinforming uh, people with uh, that is uh, what China doing is actually a measurement against the extremism or the, the trying to uh, sell this kind of narrative to the Western audience, especially say compared to attacking the countries uh, who have uh, or who have this uh, terrorist uh, risk. What China doing is better. That's the narrative they're trying to, you know, the, let others to believe. Uh, so I think, I, I mean, like, we need to find more uh, different uh, ways to uh, show people that it, this is not actually the, uh, the game of the certain country, or but the atrocity is truly happening. And uh, it's really painful to hear that people denying while those people are suffering uh, because they, I know like many Uyghurs, they lost their family members. Uh, they lost contact with their family members for years and they don't know what is happening to them. And uh, uh, all the information that they hear about this concentration camps are so worrying or scary things. So, and in addition to that, they see people denying it makes them more like, you know, the depressive or, I don't know, like more like the hopeless. Yes, people have a freedom of speech and they can say anything, but I really hope that people, more and more people stand up for Uyghurs and, uh, you know, emphasize Uyghur voices. So I believe like denial campaign will go on and we need to emphasize our voices as well. So that's the maybe only thing we can do because we cannot just uh, mute them or we cannot uh, let them, you know, don't let them speak. They can speak whatever they want. Right, yeah, thank you for the, you know, much needed reminder, right, that there are like, I think it's really easy to forget there are real people whose lives are being destroyed by what's happening. And that includes Uyghurs back in the region, but also Uyghurs on the outside who are taking a lot of risk sometimes to speak out. Um, you made reference earlier to your own you know, video testimonials and so forth. What other kinds of, um, advocacy and activism have Uyghurs around the world started to do over the last few years that might be interesting to the audience members to hear about? Uh, I would say like uh, 2017 we didn't have much thing uh, like personally I send maybe hundreds of emails to the different media outlets nobody actually responded to me by then then the beginning of 2018, we started this um, video testimonial campaigns. Then uh, the, the Rushana Bas, one of the Uyghur activists, she started uh, One Voice, One Step campaign. Uh, it was like serial demonstration. Then I started uh, the Freedom Tour campaign, uh, the serial demonstration. Uh, start from Helsinki, capital of Finland, and I traveled almost all the Western European countries. Then it continued to the uh, Asia and Europe. I mean, like Asia and America. Been to Japan and the USA as well, and we go to meet with different interviews. Uh, then, uh, how to say, the World Eagle Congress organized the two big uh, demonstration in a, uh, once in a in a Brussels. So the other time is also in Brussels, but. Uh, once is the beginning of 2018, April, if I remember. Second time was in uh, December, or oh, not December, October. Then the Uyghur Human Rights Project doing uh, information and more like the, how would say, academic works, or the, uh, how would say, the providing us with the more academic uh, uh, document, 
uh, how to say the material so we can you know the adopt it then we can even sometimes just to print it out and give it to the diplomats or the other politicians or other NGOs. Uh, then we did we did this uh, Me Too Uyghur campaign uh, in the uh, February of 2019. Uh, so all I mean, like those are the the campaigns the Uyghurs uh, been doing, and I think Uyghurs cannot do much more because all what you can do is like giving information and uh, speaking out what's happening to us and to our relatives because we don't have uh, international nominee organizations. So, so what we have is World Uyghur Congress, uh, Uyghur Human Rights Project, or Campaign for Uyghurs, or Uyghur American Association, or the Uyghur Aid, for example. Mm -hmm. I'm, maybe, I'm maybe only uh, like the, uh, how to say, the one person protest or others, like Abdrim, uh, he is doing the one single person a demonstration in, front, in the dam square. We're trying our best to let our voice being heard. Uh, I really hope like academics or the international nominee organizations and the uh, states like democratic countries who have this human rights and uh, democracy as their uh, basic principles of their state could uh, help us uh, to put more pressure on China's authority. Uh, that China's authority make a uh, a uh, shift on its uh, Uyghur policy, uh, release all these Uyghurs uh, who are being sent to concentration camps or being unjustly imprisoned. For example, Rahila Dawood and uh, other Uyghur intellectuals, like over 400 Uyghur intellectuals are being sen sentenced uh, or being sent to concentration camps. Like Halmurat Hopur is a principal of Xinjiang Medical University. Yeah, mm -hmm. he is being sentenced to death. Uh, that's unbelievable. It really, truly is, and it's very, um, it's a very heartbreaking situation for sure. Um, I think I want to ask one more question, and I'll I'll pose it to Andre, and then we can go into the audience Q and A. Um, but I was just thinking as I was hearing Hal Marat speak about all the things that we were have doing um, have been doing around the world about um the role that um, journalists and the role that the media has played in helping to, to sort of amplify you know, um, this situation. Um, could you comment at all about what the media coverage on this issue has been like, Andre? Um, I, yeah, I think, the, I think the media coverage has been uh, substantial on this issue. I mean, even several uh, major uh, global agencies have picked up the story and uh, it's gotten into, it's become a topic of, of debate uh, in, the, in a global sense to a certain degree. But I think it's important uh, that uh, the topic uh, gets, uh, keeps getting picked up and keeps getting connected to other other aspects of, uh, of the China issue, because I think these are very closely linked. And uh, especially in the view of the, um, for example, COVID pandemic or other major global issues, I think it's important to make links between these developments and keep uh, following up on this issue because uh, the situation in Xinjiang uh, of uh, Uyghurs and other minorities really is not changing for any better. Uh, on the contrary, according to latest research by the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, the scope of the re-education camps is growing. They are becoming more closely integrated with the factories and the forced labor system. So the system, the, the Chinese Communist Party in a way is working uh, to, to normalize the situation and to um, convince the world that everything is is uh, the way it should be and it's, it's just not true so I think it's important that media keep doing their work in on the in this respect along with academics and state governments etc I think the synergy between the various uh, yeah. let's say professions or uh, yeah professions is very very important in this respect yeah it takes a village right to be a little bit cliche, 
I, I would say it takes a village. Um, really quickly, a follow up. Do you know of anyone writing in Spanish on this issue? Yes, I think uh, we have uh, before the before this debate. I think all of us have put together a short list of of several Spanish language materials, which we will be able to share later with with our um, audience. Yeah, great. And I even know uh, Nieves Perez, a U.S. based, a Washington D.C. based reporter, um, writing in Spanish, is also writing about it. So that might be of interest. Um, so those of you out there in the audience, if this is something kind of new uh, to you or that something you just want to follow up on and learn more about, then, um, you know, there, there is some writing out there. Okay, so um, I will turn now to some of the audience questions that have come in. So the first is from Pedro from Uruguay, who asks, when did this repression begin? And has everything worsened with she? So I think you touched on it. You both touched on this a little bit, but it might be nice to kind of revisit it in a more systematic way, maybe. Uh, if you say this uh, concentration camp when it started, I would, I would say like uh, March or April of 2017, and uh, my mom was among very first to have been sent to uh, this concentration camps. Yeah, the by then, like it's uh, Xi Jinping was, uh, you know, the president of China. But in Chinese, they say chairman. I don't know why in the Western media, when since when Western media uh, changed the translation of Sunli into <laughs> president, well, it's uh, chairman Xi. I think it's a more correct way to say uh, mm -hmm. chairman Mao and chairman Xi. So it's not, it's not totally clear from the, the question that I see, because it looks like Pedro did a, a great job asking a very succinct question. Um, I think he might mean the repression that you both mentioned that has been going on for decades that precedes this yeah. and that leads up to it. Um, I think maybe more specifically, when do you, we've already established, do you both see that as, um, you know, being connected to what's happening now. When do you see that starting, Andre? I think it started, um, I think uh, what's happening now is, is an outcome of the ethnic policy of the Chinese Communist Party. It's, uh, this is the direction that uh, the party has been working towards since its inception and since its uh, formal arrival in Xinjiang in, uh, Fall um, uh, 1949. So w w there are variations uh, right now. Since 2016, we are going through obviously a extremification or radicalization of Chinese ethnic policy in Xinjiang. But uh, even the more liberal periods in the previous decades, the general interest of uh, the Chinese Communist Party is to assimilate Uyghurs to limit uh, their uh, political, cultural rights, to curb their identity, etc. Okay, so all the way back to 1949, you can see some clear connections, or like a trajectory. In a broader sense, yes. In a broader sense, yes. Yes, right? or trajectory even before that, because Communist policies, they have arrived to Xinjiang already in 1930s, along with uh, Governor Sheng Shuzhai. So even before that, uh, 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 recently an, uh, um, mm, an, a leading Uyghur intellectual, Asad Suleiman, has just published a book in Turkey, in Uyghur, which is called 1937-1957. Uh, and 2017, which compares this uh, the the trend of severe attack on Uyghur identity self which has happened in these very periods. So there are similar similarities um, among these uh, or in these periods when when a radical uh, communist ethnic policy was implemented in these years. The outcomes are very similar. The purges of 1937 
they ended up with the Uyghur, with almost entire Uyghur intelligentsia or elite strata being physically eliminated, wiped out. Okay, thank you for um, yeah adding a, like some historical perspective to what we've been hearing about today. Dates, you know, are helpful and different time senses are helpful, but it's it's so it might be kind of stark or or surprising for people who are new to this issue. Uh, Falmarat, do you have anything else to add? I know this kind of picks up on things you were yeah. talking about earlier, Andre's yeah. comments. Yeah. Well, thanks for Andre's uh, wider you know picture. I was I was just saying like this uh, concentration camp when it started. Well, as as much as I know, it started like the March of two thousand six. 17 but uh, uh there are there are others have uh, you know different argument they say uh, early 2000 they saw similar uh, camps in a southern part of the xinjiang or east turkestan or uyghur region whatever you want to call it so uh i'm not expert on this uh, so personally like uh i was too young to notice all this kind of policy shifts while I was in Xinjiang or Turpan. I moved from the region like 2003 uh, to uh, central China and uh, graduated my university. Then I study abroad and uh, later, you know, I'm, I'm now living in Finland. So mm -hmm. as long as I remember, uh, uh, I am the one of those uh, who was in a the product of this bilingual language uh, schools or bilingual education system. Uh, it started 2000 maybe, but before that they initiated in different schools. So yeah, that's all I can recall and all other knowledge I learned from the, the other, you know, the intellectuals book uh, books like uh, about Uyghurs. So. Well, that's, um, yeah, it's a, back to it taking a village, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, a convergence and a synergy between people, you know, covering different aspects of this. Yeah. I, I would I, also just, oh, go ahead. No, I am, I'm just a physician, I'm not historian. Like, although I'm Uyghur, but I live abroad so long and uh, I left from the region, I don't know how many years, so mm -hmm. like 17 years. Uh, my connection to the region kind of cut it uh, since the, this China start to adopt this new measurement or new policies to Uyghurs. So all my friends like they refuse to contact me anymore, like or they are afraid to contact me because simply because I live abroad. So yeah, yeah. Um, I lived just really quickly. I'll say I lived in the region. Um, doing my research and living my life from the end of 2012 until the middle of 2016. And um, you know, the surveillance state was being built up and people were starting to disappear in 2014 and 2015, especially, and then early 2016. And a lot of things were happening. And when I look back now, it's very clear that you know, the precursors to what is happening now were kind of coming into place. But at the time, it was really impossible to have a sense of how it fit together or where it might go. And it's, it's kind of chilling to think back on. Okay, we have some other questions that have come in. Um, one, I see, I don't see a name with it. That's okay, I'll go ahead and ask it is, has the UN made any statements about this issue? Maybe it's better you answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> You're following this uh, more than us. I mean, I'm following it to some extent. So the UN, yeah. um, the UN has has taken a, a quite complicated approach to this. Andre, would you like to? No. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I leave the floor to you. I would say, oh, I agree. It's complicated. Go ahead. Well, it's complicated, and to the best I know, I mean, part of one thing to ask is, what do we mean by statement? Because like the UN as 
a whole has made, you know, no sort of statement. This issue continues to be raised with special rapporteurs. It continues to be raised in all sorts of side events and so forth across the UN. Um, people who work in the UN have expressed concern to some extent or another, but um, as for any sort of formal condemnation or you know formal statement, um, even strongly worded, right? Questioning what's happening. I don't know of of any such thing that that the UN has put out. What about either of you, Andre or Paul Murat? No, I'm same thing. I'm not aware of anything substantial uh, at the, the human rights committees. There is always usually a statement by several countries criticizing China, such as the last session of the human rights. Uh, council was uh, 39 countries criticizing China and uh, a little bit uh, fewer countries supporting China. Uh, the trend generally is for the number of criticizing countries to grow and for the number of uh, sub China, countries supporting China to slightly decrease. But uh, so far the UN has uh, failed to take uh, a meaningful uh, position on this issue. Yeah, and I and a whistleblower actually recently came forward claiming that named Emma Riley, a human rights lawyer who works for the the Human Rights Office, claiming that um, there have been a lot of internal problems with the UN sort of breaking norms and rules and so forth, which have been. Um, chilling account to to look into if you're interested in looking more into this but yeah there it looks like there are a lot of structural and other challenges to meaningful action at the un unfortunately yeah basically china is trying to take over mm. yeah i've been to united nations uh three times if i recall correctly uh, but you know, uh, we only met with the representative of uh, countries, like over 16 different countries, like including USA, Japan, and uh, Canada, for example. Uh, we talked to them, we're trying to educate, you know, if they could uh, do something. But and one and the only uh, part of the United Nations, I don't know, like the special working group is the part of the United Nations or not. They are not funded by the United Nations, as far as I know. Uh, I, I have contacted with them, and uh, they are, you know, the collecting evidences or informations about Uyghurs. But uh, that's all I know. Like when this uh, UPR against uh, China was uh, like last year, right? I was there, and I was, you know, one of this uh, small advocacy group. Uh, met with different people, different uh, countries, but nothing really happened actually. Well, I'm not, well, I'm as an activist, I think it's okay for being pessimistic, but uh, I hope like United Nations uh, could do more, but it become uh, upsetting. Yeah. Yeah, right. Well, that maybe leads really naturally into a question that I see that's just come in, um, which is, you know, for more action, right? How can other states and individuals help this cause? And that comes from um, Camila or Camila from Uruguay. So, what can people do? What can governments do? I mean, like, for example, well, if allow me to speak first, then I, I believe like Andre how more, uh, uh, you know, the general picture, more insightful opinions. Uh, as a, as Uyghur, uh, I hope uh, countries, for example, European countries or those countries who are hosting uh, Uyghur diaspora communities in their country, could uh, help uh, Uyghurs live in their own country uh, with, uh, for example, personal cases, like if their uh, relatives are being in a, uh, sent to concentration camps, they could 
to ask uh, Chinese authority, like uh, one of our citizens, family member, for example, uh, disappeared. Uh, that's uh, Finnish government actually helped me uh, did something like this, like they send the note, uh, not uh, the letter to the Chinese uh, foreign ministry and ask like Halmarat's parents being disappeared, and he said this, uh, can you help? us to find out what's happening to our citizens, uh, relatives, uh, immediate relatives uh, who are your citizens. Then Chinese authority uh, responded that with a very uh, annoying question. He says, uh, Halmrad should uh, prove that his parents are his parents, then we can try to help him. <laughs> Uh, it's I I started the university I graduated university until the university I was in China. Uh, my parents are their citizens. I give them uh, their passport number, everything. Uh, I don't believe they cannot find it. So, but anyway, it gives pressure to the Chinese authority. Mm. And uh, we have uh, uh, you know the Uyghurs in diaspora in some countries are not that safe. I don't want to name any country here, but uh, for example, in some countries, some Uyghurs are being uh, detained for no reasons uh, to the detention, not, uh, you know, the migration camps, although they live in that country so many years, like the five or six years, they should be granted as a citizen, but yet you don't have this residence permit. Uh, like Turkey, the, it's one of the largest Uyghur diaspora community hosted by Turkey. So I really hope they could do more than just, uh, you know, the hosting them. Uh, to, for example, uh, they could uh, residence permit, could they issue a residence permit for them so that could easy their lives. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand like uh, as a, one of the developing country like Turkey and other countries, maybe they cannot really stand up against China, but they could help the Uyghurs who live in their own territory. And the other democratic countries like Canada and the Europe, I hope they can do more. Sorry, take too much time. No, 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 no. It's great. It's, it, it's, this is what we're here for. This is what the audience is here for. Andre, do you have any suggestions? What can um, governments or individuals or maybe organizations even do? I think you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. No, I, I don't. Uh, I think Hamurat has said it all pretty much. I think governments have uh, obligation to confront China, uh, both on bilateral level and on multilateral or transnational level. Confront China, ask questions about Xinjiang, about Hong Kong, about other closely related issues, because as uh, I think Xinjiang is just one facet of, of the uh, trend, uh, China is, or the direction the Communist Party of China has been working uh, towards, I think the governments are obliged to take measures to prevent uh, business uh, with entities uh, involved in Uyghur forced labor or involved in the Chinese uh, security state, for example, entities like Huawei, ZTE, etc. I think uh, governments have uh, responsibility uh, to help Uyghur diaspora. So, for example, make uh, immigration policy for Uyghurs and other repressed uh, communities in China very smooth without any barriers so that people can uh, seek asylum in in uh, outside of china uh, i think they should uh, develop uh, mechanisms to support their uyghur diasporas or uyghur uh, refugee seekers and holders uh, i think governments should also support research on china and listen to the experts and researchers yeah thank you so you both you both mentioned a lot about governments, and I'll just jump in and add. <laughs> I sent, um, I think it, it should have gone in the comments already for those of you watching by Facebook and other streams, um, but my organization, the Uyghur Human Rights Project, has a page titled What You Can Do. 
um, that spells out some actions you can take as individuals or maybe even as leaders of organizations, right? Because we've got to got to start with awareness raising and advocacy on the grassroots and, you know, go from there, right? It takes a village. So um, there are some campaigns to end Uyghur forced labor. So there's, um, on, on this page I sent, there is a link to um, something you can sign as an organization if you lead an organization like a trade union or an NGO or a faith-based group. You might be interested in that. There are several petitions, including one about forced labor that you could sign as an individual. Um, you, you could donate to UHRP or to another organization, another Uyghur organization, you know, that can really use um, financial help to continue doing advocacy and research. Um, there might be volunteer or internship opportunities. Um, you can find, you know, people and organizations to follow as well via email, via social media, so that you can stay aware and then turn around and share. Sometimes the simple act of sharing something <laughs> is really important because that's how awareness grows, right? Um, we have a number of other questions. Um, I think we maybe have time for just about one more, unfortunately. We're not gonna be able to get through everything here. Um, but Carlos from Uruguay wants to know whether public events like um, demonstrations and so forth have done anything to change China's position on what's happening. Have, what kinds of impacts are public events having, having on China and its response? Khamrat as an organizer and participant in such events. Do you have any? Uh, yeah, like if I, my personal experience is, of course, like we cannot uh, change it like this uh, in a second, but gradually uh, we can put more pressure on the Chinese authority. And at the same time, we can create more awareness in, uh, in, uh, in our surrounding areas or in our uh, social network. Organizing different events, yeah, it helps. And at the same time, like uh, in the beginning, for example, like I mentioned earlier, I sent uh, hundreds of emails to the different uh, media outlets. They haven't responded me in the beginning. Then, then after like I started all different kind of campaigns, they started to notice, and uh, we gradually, uh, you know, the, uh, how to say the how this reputation then they start to invite us to go to different places for example i've been invited to 16 uh, dif uh, 16 or 17 different universities give a speech uh, about the uyghurs and uh, uh, being uh, interviewed over 600 times so i mean like all this thing so far if we say like emphasizing our voices uh, we have now like uh, in the beginning only me and a few others are standing up and speaking about our personal cases and uh, overall what's happening to Uyghur people. Now there are more Uyghurs uh, trying to advocate for uh, their relatives. And we can emphasize their voices or we can help. Uh, yeah, that's uh, all I wanna say, so. Great. Yeah, thank you. So I, I do see one more question I want to address just really quickly. Someone from um, what looks like is CESCOS, C-E-S-C-O-S, -E -S, a think tank in Uruguay, asks if, um, are you, I think all of us, in contact with any NGOs or think tanks um, inside or outside China that support this cause? And I would say from the perspective of UHRP, yes, for sure. We are in touch with um, think tanks and all sorts of, you know, other NGOs and organizations that do support this cause, broadly speaking. Um, I imagine Andre and Khamrat, you kind of have similar <laughs> um, yeah. experience. Yeah, it, truly this is, I mean, I, I would just say that truly this is an international movement and an international cause. Um, at the, however, I note that it is, I'm in Washington, D.C. It is now 1147 a.m., meaning we've already gone a little bit over um, the time we originally allotted for this event. Um, but there were some great 
questions that we just wanted to try to get to and ask our panelists. Um, do either of you have any concluding thoughts you would like to share, Hamra or Andre? Uh, if I say like, I, I would repeat the same word, like the Holy Trinity of Hope and our friends are the center of the Uyghur movement so far. Uh, you can be, you know, our friend, you can be a good Samaritan to help Uyghurs. So you, we need you. That's what I want to say to everyone who listened to this. Wow. Yeah, I would just add that uh, it's really important that uh, people keep paying attention to, to the situation of Uyghurs because it uh, also displays a variety of other problems which are now happening in China and elsewhere in the world. So I think it's really important that people pick this issue up and keep working on it. I think those are excellent notes on which to, to wrap this discussion up. Um, if you know you have more questions out there that you didn't have a chance to ask, by all means, you know you can find our emails. You can find information about all of us, I think, very easily online. I know I would be really happy um, to hear from you and discuss with you further. And I think Kalmarat and Andre would say the same. Um, so thank you very much for your time and your attention and. We hope to, you know, um, continue seeing some of you as, a, you know, part of this, this international response and this international community. So, thank you. Mm -hmm.